Okay, we're going to kind of switch over to the other end of the spectrum and uh, talk a little bit about the uh, uh, applications for athletes now. So not necessarily uh, you know, the therapeutic uh, benefits of ketogenic diets, which has a much more substantial amount of research to support. Uh, the work in athletes is, frankly, uh, from my perspective, more fun. Uh, these are some great um, individuals that I've had the privilege of working with, um, but uh, equally exciting in terms of just the uh, profound effect on, on, on their performance and, um, and more than just elite athletes, just helping the average person uh, get the benefits of exercise. So, um, so I, I'll start with this similar slide that I did the other talk um, and just reiterate again uh, this idea that restricting carbs really gives us access to fat for fuel and the idea that that could be beneficial for an athlete uh, is something that really is a 180 degree perspective um, based on you know our current thinking of what's optimal nutrition for athletes I mean we've been told for decades that athletes need carbs to perform optimally that you know, we really have this supremacy of high carb diet mentality around uh, athletes in particular, not just for health, but for performance. Um, and when you eat a high carbohydrate diet, you know, it metabolically forces us to be dependent on carbohydrate. So it's kind of a self-reinforcing type of behavior that if, as long as you eat carbs, uh, including for athletes, you become more dependent on carbs, which is why athletes need to constantly consume gels and drinks during exercise. And, you know, part of the reason is they're inhibiting their other fuel source, fat. So, um, so as I said, this has been the driving um, force in sports nutrition for as long as we've been uh, advocating uh, low fat diets uh, for health. Uh, so it really goes back to the 1960s um, when, just to give you a sort of a quick historical uh, understanding of, of the uh, origins of the supremacy of high carb diets, I mean it actually goes back a little further. Uh, if you go back to the 1920s, uh, we, um, we had some evidence that um, after running the Boston Marathon, you know, individuals had low blood sugar. So the following year, 1925, they they had the uh, idea, let's supplement carbohydrates in some athletes, and sure enough, they performed better and had uh, less low blood sugar. But you didn't see a lot happen. We didn't have a great understanding of metabolism. We had no understanding of glycogen at that time. Uh, you saw a little work done in the late 30s uh, by um, Christensen and Hansen. Uh, a lot of this early work was done in the Scandinavian countries. But it wasn't until the 60s that uh, you had individuals like Bergstrom and uh, Harris who started to use the muscle biopsy technique uh, in exercise uh, science uh, in looking at um, glycogen levels in athletes. And they basically discovered this association between low glycogen, decreased performance, and the need for supplementing with carbohydrates to prevent that glycogen depletion and impaired performance. And that was really the start of the high carb paradigm. And of course, after that, you have a lot of events happening. Um, you know, Gatorade Sports Science Institute and the invention of Gatorade and just uh, dozens and hundreds of exercise scientists made their whole career on studying carbohydrate supplementation. Uh, and you have a multi-billion dollar industry uh, behind it. And, you know, Gatorade was genius. And, you know, they, they bought out a lot of the top exercise scientists, put them on their boards, funded their research. And that's, you know, that's sort of confirmation bias existed over the decades and still continues to. And so we're kind of butting up against that with this idea that a low-carb diet might actually be beneficial for athletes. Um, and, of course, on this historical line, I've put Tim Noakes there too because he was really one of the pioneers in uh, advocating for high carbohydrate diets. But of course, as well, I think all you know, uh, he's done a complete U-turn on that perspective and uh, uh, of course um, has caught quite a bit of flack for that. 
So you have people like Tim Noakes who, uh, who have, have made the switch, uh, and you have a whole range of other athletes, and many of you are familiar with Sami Inc. and, and uh, his uh, accomplishments um, as an Ironman triathlete and his rowing uh, uh, adventure from California to Hawaii, which is featured in the Serial Killers 2 movie. And so we're starting to have at least a group of, of scientists who are questioning this uh, obligate need for carbohydrate uh, in athletes. So I'll just give you a few of, of these uh, anecdotes from individuals that um, had the opportunity to meet and study uh, in some cases. Uh, but it kind of started in 2012. Uh, I took a group of my uh, students out to the Western States Endurance Run. This is uh, a pretty grueling 100-mile race in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Uh, so it's at altitude. There's a lot of uh, uh, up and down, uh, ascend and descending mountains. Um, it's a trail run. Uh, and uh, we, we had the opportunity to study a group of low-carb athletes, a group of high-carb athletes. And I'll just share with you, among um, the many of the low-carb athletes, this is Tim Olson who uh, in 2012, uh, which is the year we were out there, won the race. He's a very openly low-carb uh, uh, ultra runner. I don't know if you can see the time here, but he finished that 100-mile race in 14 hours and 46 minutes. That happened to be a course record. Uh, I think the, the second place finisher was at least a half hour behind him. Uh, so just a tremendous accomplishment. I was at the finish line there, and he finished like he ran around the block. Uh, it was just an incredible uh, feat of physical performance. Uh, and it wasn't an anomaly. He came back the following year and won under really extreme uh, uh, heat. That was one of the hottest years ever there. So it was a little slower time, but again, won pretty comfortably. And he's clearly not the only low-carb athlete that's doing well. Uh, this is Zach Bitter, who I've gotten to know quite well. Um, he, uh, I think, I've switched to a low-carb diet about three or four years ago now. And really, just his level of running and, and uh, accomplishments in the ultra-running world, um, uh, he just started to basically win races and break records. And he's currently the 100-mile track record. So he literally ran around a track, you know, for 100 miles, and uh, he accomplished that in just under 12 hours, 11 hours and 47 minutes. And he continued running and finished the distance, 12-hour distance record as well. And he's gone on to um, also, I think, break a few 50-kilometer uh, records. And I really don't think he's quite reached his peak yet. He's just really extraordinary athlete talks a lot about how the diet has enhanced his recovery, allows him to train at a, with higher volume, higher intensity, uh, and, uh, and so just a tremendous amount of self-perceived benefit. Perhaps one of the greatest ultra runners uh, is Mike Morton on the left. And Mike Morton is a major sergeant uh, and a special operations soldier who uh, who was quite an accomplished ultra runner in his 20s. He kind of disappeared for about a decade. You, know, you might guess where he was. Uh, but he came back on the scene in his late 30s uh, and started uh, competing again. And he had switched to a low carb diet and just started breaking records. Uh, you can see here, um, he competed on back to back weekends in 100 mile races and won both and including a uh, course record in one of those. And that's really unusual. Running 100 miles um, is pretty traumatic on the body. It often takes several weeks or even months to sort of fully recover from. He wanted to do a third race on the following weekend, and uh, both Steve and I sort of advised him against that. He was pretty depleted, but I think he probably, given Mike's determination, would have won that race too. And of course, Sami and Meredith, uh, on the right, um, if you're not familiar with uh, just tremendous people, they took on a heroic um, adventure in rowing in an open rowboat from California to Hawaii recently, unsupported, packed all their food, uh, which included very little carbohydrate, and, uh, and set a record um, uh, rowing over um, 2,700 miles from uh, Hawaii to, or from California to Hawaii in record time. 
Uh, and, uh, and Sami's you know, quite an accomplished triathlete and uh, incredible person. It's not just you know, individual feats um, either uh, in the ultra world. There's many sports teams now that um, are following some version of low carb. I don't have you know, a lot of details in some cases, but uh, Marty Fish is one of the top US tennis players, uh, has had a lot of uh, uh, benefit from a low carb diet. Uh, even uh, basketball in the US is quite popular. We have uh, the LA Lakers on some sort of low carb diet, and there's been a lot of media attention around that. Uh, and even the, the, the uh, Cleveland Cavaliers, which, who are in the championships, uh, Currently in the United States, you have LeBron James, who uh, at least in the off season went on some form of low carb diet. He's one of the most popular sports figures in the U.S. If you're not familiar with him, uh, and even in soccer, um, there's a team in Norway that uh, had been following a low carb diet for many years, and they recently won their championship game. And I just came to find out, uh, you know, I'm currently located in Columbus, Ohio, that we we have a uh, professional soccer team in Columbus who I met with their coach and performance director, and they have been following a low-carb diet for a year and a half and seeing tremendous benefits. So, uh, so I think in different types of football, soccer, uh, you're seeing um, benefits of, of a low-carb diet. So what's happening here? Um, you know, we, we, we were under the impression that you know, athletes needed carbs to perform well and recover. Um, but it, you know, just from a very simplistic perspective, if you look at fuel stores in the body, you know, as humans we have a limited capacity to store carbohydrate. It's just how we evolved. Uh, we can store maybe 500 grams of carbohydrate in the form of glycogen, in, mainly in skeletal muscle, some in liver as well. But that pales in comparison to the amount of energy we store as fat. Uh, so even a lean athlete, We've tested athletes um, as low as 3% body fat on our DEXA, and even they have 20,000 kilocalories worth of fat that they can access for fuel. The, um, the problem is, or the, the irony really is, that when athletes fatigue, uh, so you know, you're familiar with hitting the wall or, uh, or bonking is sometimes referred to, uh, that's a result of well, it's really a result of an energy crisis in the brain, where the brain has an you know, inadequate supply of glucose, uh, but it's correlated with glycogen depletion and low blood sugar. What's ironic about that is that that point of fatigue, which is often dramatic if you have ever experienced hitting the wall or seen someone who's hit the wall, the body shuts down, and you have these, uh, you know, these very furious uh, just drive for carbohydrate that you need, you, know, you need to have this source of, of fuel for the brain. Um, but what's ironic about it is that occurs when the athlete has tens of thousands of kilocalories on board in the form of fat. They just can't access it and utilize it efficiently. So one of my colleagues, Peter Tia, um, uses the analogy of a gas tanker running out of gas on the highway. I mean, there's a lot of fuel there, it's just not in the right place and they can't use it. Um, and that's very similar to what's happening here. So how do you utilize it? How can you train your body to become efficient at utilizing that fat on board? Well, it's, the answer is keto adaptation. And so these fat adapted or keto adapted athletes um, become bonk proof. They don't hit the wall. Even though their glycogen levels may be depleted, they're have full access to fat. And that's enough energy to get through almost all sorts of uh, competitions that they may be participating in, even 100 mile runs. So um, we don't know a lot about the keto adapted athlete. Uh, so one uh, idea we had was, well, let's try to convince some of these athletes who we knew some, and I knew people who were training athletes uh, using low-carb, high-fat diets, so, I, so I, we, we kind of met as a, a group and thought, well, what, do we, what would we have to do to get these athletes to come to our lab and, and just kind of put them through a battery of tests and see what makes them tick? Uh, so we designed this study called the FASTER study, which stands for Fat Adapted Substrate Oxidation and Trained Elite Runners. And our, again, our, our main hope was just to convince people to come and let us study them 
primarily the, you know, their metabolic responses to exercise. Quite to my surprise, we, we had a tremendous response. Uh, these, this group of ultra runners is a pretty tight community and they just really embraced this project. As word got out, we had more than uh, enough athletes, uh, we couldn't accommodate them all. What we ended up doing was studying 10 high carb athletes, so these were very accomplished athletes who were following the more traditional high carb approach. And then we also had a matched group of uh, equally high caliber athletes that were following a low carb diet. And we did a very um, careful job of matching them. We didn't want there to be differences between groups in any other physical characteristics other than their diet. And we did a pretty good job. They're similar age, similar uh, body weight, body composition, and even similar aerobic capacity. So very similar maximal oxygen consumptions. So these were high level athletes. They were all sort of finishing in the top 10% of uh, races. They were also uh, all ultra runners. So they were competing in anything from 50K to 100K to even 100 mile races. We had a couple triathletes, but they really were focused on the running component. Uh, so very well matched, very highly trained. Main difference, their diet. So this is their habitual diet. Uh, high carb, pretty standard, I guess. You know, over half their energy coming from carbohydrate. Um, fat, very moderate. But the low carb guys were pretty low carb, and that was by design. We wanted to really focus on the athletes who were pretty serious about restricting carbs. So you can see levels about 10 to 12 percent. For these guys, they're eating a lot of calories. That equates to maybe 75 grams of carbs per day. And this is the testing battery. You know, we flew them into our lab and tried to get them in in the morning or early afternoon and then had them uh, participate in a maximal oxygen consumption test to determine their peak fat oxidation. And then day two was the long day where we had them uh, in the lab most of the day going through a variety of blood tests and so forth. And it kind of featured a three hour run on a treadmill that was performed at a submaximal pace, 65% of their VO2 max. And since we had them there for a limited time, uh, we really kind of like a hunter got as much off their carcass as we could. We, we collected blood, we collected urine, we collected muscle, collected fat cells, collected stool samples, uh, everything we could get from these guys. And we're still in the process of analyzing a lot of that data. But I'll share with you some of the, the uh, primary results that, um, that we have to date. Um, so I, you know, this was a, a pretty a, a intense couple days for these guys and uh, I was really worried they were going to uh, leave our lab and uh, never want to talk to us again. But I, I have to say, they, these were the most gracious subjects. Uh, we were poking and prodding them and cutting into their legs and extracting muscle tissue out of it. Our lab, we have a lot of nice expensive equipment, but it's not glamorous. Um, we were forcing them to stare at a blank wall for three hours as they ran on a treadmill. Uh, but they loved it. They left the lab thanking us and, uh, and definitely wanted to participate in future studies. So uh, just a really a tremendous experiment. I've done a lot of human studies and never quite experienced this level of enthusiasm for, for research. So these guys are pretty happy despite the fact they were going through a lot of invasive testing. So just to kind of give you the context, this is not from the FASTER study, but this is from a published study that in, in my um, reading of the literature is the most uh, comprehensive uh, study to look at peak fat oxidation in humans. And this is a group of over 300 individuals where they had them exercise and determine their peak fat oxidation. And this included some very elite athletes, endurance athletes. And you can see the red dotted line there that uh, in this group of, of individuals, the highest rate of fat oxidation is one gram per minute. And that's about the highest rate I've ever seen published in the literature. Not average, but just even individual highest rate. So just consider that um, value uh, for context here. So this is the peak fat oxidation in our faster uh, athletes. 
So again, both groups, highly accomplished athletes, but dramatically different peak fat oxidation. I love this type of data because you don't even have to run statistics on it. Um, there's just no overlap here. The highest fat burner in the low carb group is significantly higher than the peak fat burner in the, in the high carb group. So on average, you have a two-fold greater increase in fat oxidation. You're 50% higher than the highest rate ever reported. So uh, these guys are just extraordinary fat burners. Now when you put that into uh, context here, um, you know, this is sort of a classic figure you see in exercise physiology textbooks where you have a gradual increase in fat oxidation as you go from low to moderate intensity exercise. You know, peaking around 0.6, that's a really pretty decent level of fat oxidation, uh, generally speaking. But then as you increase uh, exercise intensity from moderate to, to high, you see a rather precipitous drop in fat oxidation. So that's kind of that you know, inverted U-shaped curve. Here's a similar graph from our faster subjects uh, during the VO2 max test. So you see the high carb athletes more or less mirror that, that standard graph uh, on the previous slide. But look at the hot low carb athletes. They are uh, significantly higher and the curve is shifted to the right. So they're able to burn more fat at any submaximal exercise intensity and they're also able to burn fat at higher exercise intensities. So on average, peak fat oxidation occurred at 77% VO2 max in these low carb athletes and it was around 55%, which is typical in the high carb athletes. So this is data from the three hour run. The uh, high carb athletes uh, performed as tip typical, uh, you, where you've got about a 50-50 mix of carb and fat contributing to the energy demands and that contribution from fat kind of increases as a function of duration as they deplete their glycogen. Whereas the low carb athletes uh, derived al almost 90% of their fuel from fat the entire three hours, so it was very stable. So around 10% of the energy coming from carb is all. So as you'd expect, the rates of carb oxidation are significantly lower, the rates of fat oxidation are significantly higher so that's relatively speaking. Here's the absolute levels of fat oxidation in the, in the athletes. So the, at 60, it ended up being 64% VO2 max. These guys were burning 1.2 grams per minute. Pretty constant over the three hours of running on the treadmill. About two-fold higher levels of fat oxidation compared to the high-carb athletes. So again, Tremendous fat burners here, but I, I just want to remind you, these are both groups of extraordinary athletes. These high carb guys, if anything, were probably had a few of these guys who were Olympic uh, level athletes. Uh, and, uh, and so um, you've, you can perform at a high level with two different dietary approaches that have very, two very different metabolic effects. So we measured a lot of metabolites in the blood. I'll just kind of point out a few um, important uh, aspects here. So we measured glucose, surprisingly not that different. Uh, insulin levels were tended to be a bit higher uh, in the high carb group. What's really interesting and expected though uh, is that the ketones were, were higher in the low carb group, but even the high carb athletes observed an increase in ketones during exercise sort of this post-exercise ketosis, or it's been referred to as the Cortis Douglas effect. Uh, so you see about a two-fold increase in ketones at the end of exercise, but as you'd expect, much higher in the low-carb group. Serum glycerol, which is a, a really good marker of lipolysis um, uh, or fat breakdown, uh, was uh, dramatically higher in the low-carb group. So uh, kind of predicted here as you're, um, exercising, you're breaking down more fat in a, in a low insulin fat adapted state. And so that's providing more fatty acids for skeletal muscle. Interestingly, fatty acids were not different. Um, but I think that's because the kinetics were not addressed. We're just measuring sort of static m markers here. So if we were doing rate of appearance and disappearance of fatty acids, we would see a difference. 
But glycerol is a better marker anyway because fat and skeletal muscle can't reutilize glycerol. It lacks glycerol kinase. This is really um, new data that um, was very shocking to me um, because I would have bet my house that the glycogen levels would have been lower at rest and there would have been a significant attenuation of glycogen use during exercise, but we observed just the opposite. The uh, glycogen levels were identical between the low carb and the high carb group. So even at rest, similar glycogen levels, they both had similar rates of glycogenolysis during two hours, three hours of running, and then two hours of recovery, they had the same resynthesis of glycogen. Despite the fact that we actually, I didn't mention it, we gave the high carb group a high carb shake, or uh, it was not a high calorie shake, but we gave them, we felt like we had to give them something, so we gave them a little bit of glucose at the end. We gave the low carb group fat, equal calories. Um, so that makes it even more surprising that these low carb guys are able to resynthesize glycogen without any provision of carbs really post exercise. So uh, I'm still somewhat scratching my head over this. Um, you see the variability here too, it's pretty uniform. I mean there are variations in starting levels but everybody goes down and goes up and it's a similar level of variation in the two groups. Uh, what's really uniform, though, is the rate of resynthesis. I mean, this is, that's almost unheard of, where everybody's got the same slope here. Uh, more variation here. But, you know, I, I really don't have a great explanation for this, um, other than there seems to be some chronic adaptation to a low-carb diet that really preserves and protects glycogen. And, and there must be metabolic alterations to, uh, to resynthesize glycogen without you know, really having a source of glucose. So this could be lactate, could be glycerol, serving as a source of carbons for glycogen synthesis. Uh, I will say there is somewhat of a hint of this in the literature. Uh, if you look at uh, Alaskan sled dogs, uh, these are probably the greatest athletes on the planet where you know, when they race this Iditarod race, it's a thousand miles uh, from Anchorage to Nome. Uh, just tremendous metabolic feat these dogs um, undertake to accomplish that. Um, and interestingly, they have been studied. There's been muscle biopsy studies. They've measured glycogen levels. And the dogs that you know, do well and win this race, um, first of all, they follow a low-carb, high-fat diet. That's the diet they prefer. Um, but they also maintain their glycogen levels. So um, I never paid a lot of attention to that research. I thought it was a little bogus or didn't apply to human species, but I'm thinking there's something important there. I guess the other important point that I may not have said is um, these low-carb athletes were on the diet for an average of 19 months. So really what we're looking at here is long-term adaptations to a low-carb diet in elite endurance athletes. So of course we have Steve Finney's work, many of you may be familiar with, um, you know, to compare to, and it, but his was only four weeks in duration. So there may be another level of adaptation beyond four weeks that uh, uh, specifically, um, you know, alters our ability to uh, uh, manage glyco glycogen homeostasis. So we've done a lot of other uh, analytical measures in this study that we're still trying to get our head around. Uh, for one, we looked at whole uh, transcriptome analysis of skeletal muscle. So um, the technologies available to us now are just unbelievable. So in one tiny, tiny piece of skeletal muscle, we can look at quantitative gene expression of all known genes. So that's 25,000 plus genes. So I've got this massive Excel sheet that I'm trying to get my head around um, with all this data. But um, I just thought I'd show you a couple of the top genes that were most significant in terms of a diet effect. And these are pretty interesting, somewhat predicted too. The first one is a, a gene that codes for histone-related uh, gene, which my earlier talk, I mentioned this new discovery that ketones are potent histone deacetylase inhibitors. 
So this is kind of interesting that this is one of the top genes that came out out of 25,000 genes. So you can see very distinct differences in transcription rates between low carb and high carb at all three time points um, uh, before and after exercise. The, uh, the one in the upper right, this is a gene that codes for protein phosphatase 1, which is an important gene in glycogen regulation. Actually, uh, it con contributes to impairment of glycogen use or inhibits glycogen use. So this is even more interesting now that we have the actual glycogen data that show no difference, but yet we've got differences in a regulator of glycogen metabolism here. This is a gene that codes for HMG-CoA synthase, which is the first gene in ketogenesis. It's also a gene involved in cholesterol synthesis, uh, so uh, major upregulation in the fat adapted athletes. And the last one in the bottom right is a, a gene that codes for a protein in beta oxidation, trifunctional protein. So that's kind of a, uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense since beta oxidation has to be upregulated in these folks. But it's, it's showing that there are adaptations here at the genetic level where we're altering gene expression uh, as a result of manipulating diet. So I, I thought I would share the cholesterol results too because these, you know, I've measured cholesterol in thousands of, of individuals in response to low carb diets, so I've kind of seen everything, but I was really shocked at these levels. Again, this is a unique opportunity to look at chronic adaptation to low carb diet in a rather unique group though. These are kind of weird people and self-selected to be great runners and, and really, uh, uh, on a regular basis attempt things that we would never even think of. But their cholesterol levels were, um, you know, depending on your perception, on the scary side. Um, so this is their LDL cholesterol. Sorry, uh, milligrams per deciliter here, but uh, uh, I think you can get the idea. These are extraordinary high levels, well above the thresholds. Most physicians would get their prescription pads out and have these guys on statins. Um, but if you start to look a little deeper, uh, you see HDL cholesterol. Uh, some of these levels of HDL cholesterol are higher than I've ever seen in my life. Uh, several guys over 100 milligrams per deciliter, which is just unheard of. So, uh, so that's one important point. They're balancing this LDL cholesterol with a very high HDL, such that when you look at the ratio, they're essentially the same. So I think you know, that's important to understand. Uh, moreover, we've done some more advanced testing looking at the nuclear magnetic resonance profile that allows you to get the different particle distributions uh, of LDL and HDL and even VLDL. So uh, I picked out a few of the important ones here. So the top right, that's the small LDL. These are the bad guys. So you know, just remember, these guys had two-fold higher levels of LDL cholesterol concentration, yet they have fewer small LDL. And these are, you know, this is their, the large LDL. So the increase in LDL in these guys, it's all in the large fraction. They actually have fewer small LDL. And, and if any of you have done this NMR profile, um, they've developed an insulin resistance score based on about six or seven of these different parameters you get from the NMR profile to, that correlate with levels of insulin resistance. So this is that insulin resistance score based off the lipoprotein profile. And again, you see the low-carb athletes are much more insulin sensitive than the high-carb. Now, it's not that these guys are insulin resistant, so I put the scale up here. This is a, uh, you know, the percentiles. So they're at 25. So they're in the, on the insulin sensitive side, they're in the 25, 25th percentile. But the low carb guys at five, you know, they're probably in the one percentile in terms of insulin sensitivity. So, uh, so there are some health benefits, I, I should say, in, you know, in terms of this diet for these guys beyond, you know, the level of training and, and health benefits associated with that. So interestingly, you know, it was, we had two days we were talking with these guys, you know, uh, 
um, constantly over that time period, and and we tried not to be biased in any way, and and uh, but we were, couldn't help. These high carb guys were asking us about low carb diets, and it turns out I think about half the high carb guys switched to a low carb diet after the study, which we need to do a now a follow up study and bring them back and do the same test. But this is just one of the testimonials from a high carb subject who switched to low carb and you can read through there and see that he's had quite a uh, uh, impressive uh, transformation in his uh, response to a low carb diet including improving his personal best and uh, setting a course record so uh, I know I realize these are anecdotes but we don't have a lot of scientific studies right now on athletes in low carb uh, diets so uh, uh, it's hard to ignore, though, when you have hundreds and, and, and perhaps more anecdotes. Um, it's starting to feel like this is more than just uh, a fad or, or uh, an anomaly. So, um, you know, my interest really is continuing to understand this better in athletes, but also soldiers. Um, you know, it's great to help athletes. They're fun to work with. But in terms of, I guess, social impact and return on investment, uh, I guess I would feel better if I could actually help our soldiers. Uh, and in many ways, they're athletes. Um, the things they do, the stressors they have to uh, deal with, uh, and I think there's a lot of application of ketogenic diets for athletes, not just physical, but cognitive. And you know, the big term in the US anyway is resiliency and the ability to uh, cope with different stressors. And, and you know, that's where I think the, the keto-adapted soldier um, really puts them at a distinct advantage. So you know, this is fairly complex, I, you know, I think, in terms of how a keto adaptation would it enhance an athletic uh, performance or enhance a soldier's uh, performance. It could be through you know, pure metabolic benefits you know, of being able to burn fat and burn ketones, which spares carbohydrate, and that in turn, you know, gives you better uh, functioning, both cognitive and physical, that can enhance performance. But now this, you know, understanding of ketones being signals, affecting gene expression, reducing oxidative stress, reducing inflammation, perhaps better gut health, uh, just better resiliency, that may play into it as well in terms of better, faster recovery, uh, enhancing longevity, uh, and so forth. So there could be a lot of different ways in which the diet may um, benefit um, the soldier or the athlete. So we clearly don't have all the answers here. We have very few, uh, in fact. So um, these are just some of the questions that I think about, some of the studies that we're trying to get off the ground to. Uh, you know, to better understand the application of this in different contexts. So, um, so we're trying to do actual prospective studies. The FASTER was just a cross-sectional study. We didn't intervene at all. We just studied athletes who, on their own volition, had been doing low-carb. So it'd be nice to track people prospectively who switched from a low-carb diet. And so we're trying to get those studies off the ground. Uh, you know, interestingly, there's a couple different forms now of ketone supplements that are commercially available. And the military has been very interested in this. In fact, uh, our D DARPA, or Defense uh, Department of Advanced uh, Research Program something, uh, who funds all our crazy research um, that NIH won't fund, uh, has invested over $10 million in developing ketone uh, supplements. And that work has continued to the point where there's starting to be some human data. But there are other groups working on clinical applications of ketone supplements. I tend to be fairly skeptical about their use because um, in most cases they're using these in the context of a moderate to high carb diet. And it's hard for me to believe you're gonna get the same benefit um, from just adding these ketones to your diet versus encouraging your body and your liver to produce ketones naturally and all the other adaptations that go along with that. But time will tell, so there needs to be some experiments um, sort of comparing and contrasting ketogenic diets versus ketone supplements. Uh, 
and then there's all sorts of questions around the different types of physical performance. You know, there's all sorts of different ways to assess performance, endurance, strength, power, et cetera. And we don't know much about the higher intensity spectrum. Uh, clearly, the endurance athletes are experiencing success, but um, we don't have a lot of data on you know, the more anaerobic athlete. The military-specific applications, again, um, it's also where I see potential funding uh, because I'm not going to convince NIH to give me millions of dollars to study athletes, I don't think. But the military um, is a viable source of funding, I hope. The um, athletes who are fat adapted are doing a variety of things in terms of their in-race nutrition. So uh, many of them do trickle in some carbs when they get into races that are three hours and beyond. It's certainly much lower amounts of carbs than their high carb counterparts or when they were carb adapted. So, um, so how that affects performance, we don't really know. Um, but there might be strategic use of carbs um, during exercise and that gets at you know, additional issues of what types of carbs or forms of carbs would be best used in those situations. And then me more basic mechanistic studies. I'm, I'm, I, I always constantly think about application, but I'm also very interested in mechanisms and understanding some of the underlying adaptations at the cellular level. Uh, so I believe that's my last slide. Um, again, I hope that was interesting and uh, helpful and happy to take additional questions. So thank you.